Throughout history, the world's top performers have known something most of us don't. From Spartan warriors to modern billionaires, there's something they do that powers their success. And it's not strength, status, money, or even genius. It's something you can tap into immediately to free up your time, upgrade your cognition, and as a bonus, it's one of the only peak performance tools that will save you money. Now, Ria Doris, co-founder and CEO of the Flow Research Collective, along with my partner, Stephen Kotler, we've taught thousands of professionals how to access flow states at will. Throughout the ages, a subtle thread has woven its way through the lives of the world's highest performers. It's a pattern that has shaped the destinies of everyone from warriors, artists, Olympians, surfers, and business leaders. This often overlooked pattern has played a key role in their remarkable achievements. Take the legendary Spartans whose rigorous military discipline and frugal lifestyle were one of the bedrock elements of their strength. With the mineral resources, a few hundred Spartans held off thousands of Persian soldiers. In the East, the samurai of feudal Japan adhered to Bushido, a code that celebrated frugality and discipline, their lives stripped of excess. Consider the samurai Miyamoto Musashi, because dueling was so high stakes, often leading to death or severe injury, most samurai might have only participated a handful of duels throughout their lifetime. Yet Miyamoto won over 60 duels. And then there's the Mongols. In the 13th century, the Mongols were nomads riding horses before they could even walk, almost like an extension of themselves. They could fire arrows with precision while riding at full gallop. They owned little more than weapons, food, and portable yurt homes. This allowed them to strike enemies like lightning and then disappear before the targets even knew what was happening, eventually forming the largest land empire of the time, four times the size of the Roman Empire. Even in monastic traditions worldwide, from Christian monks to Buddhist hermits, we find a similar pattern lives of simplicity dedicated to higher pursuits. These examples might suggest a rejection of material wealth or a life of asceticism, but that's not quite it. It's something more profound, more intentional across wildly differing contexts and cultures. There's a unifying pattern among these peak performers. The intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of everything that distracts us from it. It's not about deprivation, but radically excluding everything except the essential. This philosophy is called minimalism. Of course, it's not the sole key to the success of history's greats, but rather a recurring pattern that's contributed to and allowed them to channel their energies and talents most effectively. Contrast this approach with what the average knowledge worker deals with every day. You probably know how this goes. You go to get dressed in the morning, searching for your favorite shirt, but it's lost in the chaos of your cluttered closet. Clothes pile upon clothes, some rarely worn, yet they all jostle for space and attention. As you pack your bag for work, trying to find your charger, you rummage through drawers, moving aside gadgets you don't use, cables you don't recognize, and miscellaneous items that somehow have found their way there. You go to make coffee, forgetting that you lent the electric kettle to a friend, only you can't remember who you lent it to. A week later, when they finally give it back, the item is dented. Damn, you head toward the door to commute to work, and spot a pile of boxes, stuff you ordered online on impulse. Each unopened box is a task pending, a decision delayed. You slice one open with your keys, but see the item doesn't work as expected, and now it has to be returned. Running behind schedule, as you open the garage, you accidentally bang your watch against a wall, leaving it with a scratch. And for the next 30 minutes, you can't stop thinking about it. You walk to your car, eyeing a few surfboards in the garage that just hang there and collect dust, subtly gnawing at you, a reminder of previous passions and time poorly spent. On the way to work, instead of listening to an audiobook, you're still thinking about the damn scratch on your watch. All of this thinking about things is part of the cost of ownership. Possessions get lost or damaged or have to be returned or maintained or become an obstacle between you and some other more important target of your attention. This degrades our performance and impairs our creativity and cognition. And this cost of ownership is a consequence of how our brains are wired. It's a double-edged sword where we're hard-coded to crave and collect possessions, and also hard-coded to get bogged down by the possessions that we crave and collect. Now, in the 1960s, a significant discovery about human memory emerged from the work of George Miller, a psychologist at Harvard University. His research identified that the average number of objects an individual can hold in short-term memory is around seven, give or take two. Building on Miller's foundational work, John Sweller, psychologist and professor emeritus at the University of New South Wales, delved deeper into how our cognitive system handles information. His research unveiled a pivotal concept that would become central to understanding mental processes, learning, problem solving, and performance. And that concept is cognitive load. Cognitive load refers to the amount of information we're holding in working memory at any given time. 
these neural dynamics can be likened to a computer under a heavy load. You know when you're using your computer and it starts to stall, you're writing an email and the text appears several seconds after you type it. Websites take longer to load, you get the dreaded pinwheel of death. Well, this happens to our brains too. Figuratively, your brain is a finite amount of RAM, working memory. The higher the cognitive load, the more RAM is used up. Your brain gets slower, your ability to learn plummets, and your attention gets whipsawed. You're left with fewer attentional resources, such as focus and creativity, to devote to your priorities. What's happening in the brain to cause this overload? Well, each neuron in part of a vast network of about 86 billion can form thousands of synaptic connections. However, there's a limit to how many connections can be active simultaneously, constraining how much information can be processed at a given time. It's like a vast network of roads in a city, too much traffic and everything slows to a crawl. In the case of neurons, this traffic is the electrical and chemical signals they use to communicate. These signals are facilitated by neurotransmitters like glutamate and GABA, which act as the vehicles moving along these neural pathways. However, there's only so much neurotransmitter traffic a neuron can handle before the signal starts to get jammed, akin to a traffic bottleneck on a busy road. Then, our brain's energy demands, primarily for glucose and oxygen, add another layer of constraint. The brain, despite constituting only about 2% of the body's mass, consumes about 20% of its energy. This high energy requirement means that there is a threshold to how much information processing the brain can sustain before its performance starts to decline. All of these neurological limitations may have played a key role in our survival and evolution. The ability to quickly process a few relevant pieces of information like threats or resources was more adaptive than the ability to process a large amount of information slowly. These factors combined, neuronal traffic in energy demands create a threshold for cognitive load. Exceed this threshold and our cognitive functions like learning, attention, and problem solving start to falter. It's as if we're overloading our mental circuitry, much like a computer struggling under the weight of too many other programs. And here's the problem. Every misplaced shirt, every scratched watch, every borrowed item not properly returned unnecessarily increases cognitive load. A constant background of noise irrelevant to your goals, overloading and then sapping down your attention. On the flip side, the lower the cognitive load, the easier it is to get into a flow state, that optimal state of consciousness where we feel and function at our best. Flow can only arise when all of our attention is focused on the present moment. That's what flow triggers do. Neurologically, they increase focusing chemicals like dopamine and norepinephrine. Psychologically, they reduce cognitive load, getting everything else out of our attention so that the task at hand is all we can focus upon. But here's the thing, possessions can actively block this process from happening. Possessions possess the mind, literally, increasing our cognitive load to such an extent that it suppresses flow state. So here's a way to think about it. Your brain is a finite amount of cognitive load it can carry. Imagine that each bit of cognitive load is a portion of your focus and mental energy and costs you a certain amount of time. Now think of it like this. For every possession you own, some increment of your attention is captured. Each possession represents a piece of information the brain needs to process, requiring attentional resources for recognition, categorization, and decision-making thereby contributing to cognitive load. A single unit of attention might only equate to 10 seconds, a negligible sliver of your time. To translate the example into possessions, let's take a pair of pants that maybe cost you 100 bucks. In this case, this pair of pants may only capture the equivalent of 10 seconds worth of your attention daily. Thoughts about wearing them, cleaning them, or where to put them. But some objects consume more cognitive load than others based on the cost of the possession, its irreplaceability, how much you identify with it or its sentimental value, etc. As an example, a new iPad with its charging, maintenance and usage could take up a couple of minutes of your day. A Rolex might demand the equivalent of 10 minutes daily worth of your attention and cognitive capacity, admiring it, caring for it, or even worrying about its safety. A new house or boat represents a major investment, both financially but also in terms of the cost of our attention, possibly taking up hours each day in our cognitive capacity being allocated to maintenance, security, or simply appreciating its value. To visualize the impact these possessions have on the mind, let's calculate the total units of attention they can accumulate over a given day. Maybe your pants take up just 10 seconds a day, pretty irrelevant, the iPad a couple of minutes, a Rolex maybe 10 minutes or 600 seconds, a mansion or a boat maybe two hours. In this case, assuming you acquire all those possessions in a year, this adds up to a staggering 805 hours or approximately 34 days spent just in attending to these possessions and having them reduce cognitive capacity and increase cognitive load. That's a month 
of continuous waking attention dedicated solely to the things you own. Hence, the reason that the items we possess possess us. But here's the thing. The average knowledge worker has far more possessions than what we just walked through. Far more than just a pair of pants, an iPad, a watch, and a boat, or a house. From clothing, toys, household items, furniture, electronics, personal care products, books, old photos, musical instruments. The average number of possessions in a typical American household is often cited as 300,000 items. And while this is tricky to empirically validate, even if the amount is 10,000, there comes a point when your mind is completely absorbed by stuff. On the extreme end, this thinking about things turns material possessions into extensions of our identity and turn any threat to our possessions into a threat to ourselves. And this is only part of the problem. This increase in cognitive load doesn't just zap away your time and hijack the resources you need for productivity and flow, it also clogs up your creativity by degrading the quality of your rumination. Rumination occurs courtesy of the default mode network in the brain, which is active during your idle moments. Increased cognitive load from possessions degrades rumination on two levels. First, you end up ruminating on things that you want to buy. When we acquire something new, our brain releases pleasurable dopamine. This reward system evolved to encourage behaviors crucial for survival, like finding food or a mate. In modern contexts, it gets triggered by acquiring possessions. So when you want something, you spend time wondering about it, researching it, and lusting after it. And then, once you own the thing, you sacrifice rumination by having to manage, maintain, store, untangle, move, clean, use, and worry about the damn thing. Neuroscientific studies suggest that owning an object changes our perception of it, often increasing its perceived value and the cognitive space that it takes up. This is known as the endowment effect. This mechanism may have evolved to help us value and protect those few resources that we used to own that were crucial for our survival. The bit of food that we had, the little bit of shelter or clothing that we were able to preserve. This worked for our ancestors, but for modern professionals, the endowment effect flushes down the drain, a lot of precious default mode network rumination that could have been dedicated to solving problems, enriching our relationships or furthering our goals. Think of your default mode network as a garden where you harvest your best ideas. Each possession you own is like a weed in the garden. Every time you get a new possession, it's like planting another weed in this garden. Every moment spent managing or worrying about this item allows the weed to spread. Gradually, these weeds overtake the garden, leaving little space for the flowers and plants of creative thought, problem solving, and personal reflection. Put simply, the possessions you possess, possess the mind. From a little to a lot, you're juggling not just the demands of the present, but the accumulated demands of every item you own. As the godfather of flow state, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi put it, the acquisition and maintenance of objects can easily fill up a person's life until there is no time to do anything else, not even to use the things that are exhausting all of one's own psychic energy. When such a pass is reached, the adaptive value of objects is reversed. Instead of liberating psychic activity, the things bind it to useless tasks. The former tool turns its master into its slave. Now the question is, what happens if you strip all of the non-essential possessions out, all of the stuff cluttering up your cognition? What happens when you prune the garden of your mind and like a samurai warrior, concentrate all of your cognition on your craft, your goals, your ultimate purpose? Well, you get the opposite side of the cost of ownership. You get freedom for flow. You've probably heard about minimalism as a trendy lifestyle or stylistic thing, but maybe you haven't heard how minimalism relates to your ability to access flow state. For every physical possession you remove, you reclaim and speed up attentional capacity and you can channel it into a task and propel yourself into flow. Imagine each possession as a tab open in your brain's browser. Too many open tabs slow down your processing speed. Minimalism closes some of these tabs, the ones that are open due to the possessions that possess you, which frees up mental bandwidth. Another benefit is that minimalism also reduces friction, which is the invisible enemy between you and effortless peak performance. You no longer waste time searching for, untangling, or organizing stuff. You remove a significant amount of have to deal with it, hassle, fuss, and stress. Each of these moments of friction is like being pinched. They're tiny zaps of irritation, spike cortisol, which elevates stress. In the Journal of Positive Psychology, Researcher Joshua Hook of the University of North Texas published a systematic review of the empirical literature on minimalism. One of the findings was the strong link between minimalism and increased intrinsic motivation, including autonomy, mastery, and relatedness. When this happens, you engage in activities for their own sake instead of for extrinsic rewards. The higher your intrinsic motivation, the more flow you'll get. Thus, minimalism, with its focus on reducing possessions down to only what's essential to our craft, 
and profession can increase the frequency, the reliability, and the depth of the flow states we can access. From there, a bigger paradoxical transformation takes place that hugely affects your productivity, creativity, and performance. Perhaps you can relate to this. Growing up for my whole life, I fantasized about being able to walk into a coffee shop and buy any clothes that I wanted, or to walk into a jewelry store and buy a $300 watch without a second thought, or to go into Whole Foods and grab whatever supplements I wanted off the shelf and ring them up without care. Now, this might sound silly, but the mere thought of having that kind of money was euphoria inducing. This extrinsic motivation drove me night and day. I was utterly convinced I would love doing that once I had the means. The crazy thing is that the shifts I had to make internally to reach the financial position externally that I had fantasized about involved me having to eradicate the drive that I had to do those external things, to go shopping for that watch in the first place. Because to get the income, I had to become autotelic, enjoying the work for its own sake, for the flow that it produces. And once I became autotelic, the desire to get another high quality three hour block of flow propelling forward my purpose and mission trumped by a large margin the desire to go walk down the high street and go supplement shopping or looking for some fancy watch it's like training for a marathon initially you might aim for the prestige of finishing but along the way you fall in love with the rhythm and challenge of running itself i had to transition from being extrinsically motivated running for the medal to autotelic running for the joy of running this is what happens when you access flow with consistency and reliability you shift to living a life that is autotelic, which means you're focused on doing the work for its own sake, rather than for the outcomes the work brings you, which fundamentally changes your relationship toward possessions. To get the thing that would lead to the extrinsic outcome, you have to eradicate the part of you that wants the extrinsic outcome. This is one of the reasons that at a certain point, so many successful people strip back their possessions, like Warren Buffett, who despite his immense wealth, lives in the same modest house he bought in 1950, or Elon Musk, who sold most of his belongings in 2020 so he could focus on preserving the spark consciousness through Mars colonization, or Matthew McConaughey, who chose to live in a trailer even after becoming a millionaire, avoiding the stress of a larger home. So every time you prioritize flow over possessions, it's a measurement of how much more autotelic and intrinsically motivated your life and personality are becoming. You reinforce the value of intrinsic motivation, which is tightly linked to flow, which boosts performance more than anything else that we know of. And what the peak performer finds is that as the years go on, this shift deepens and accelerates. Your desire to acquire will slowly evaporate. As you get more flow, you'll want less stuff. As flow increases, the need for material things decreases. It's not to say that you won't ever want or have stuff. Consider the surfer or guitarist who obsesses about their surfboards or guitars. They love these objects, sure. But what they really love is about how these objects drive them into an optimal state of consciousness, a state of flow. So over time, possessions become tools for flow rather than goals in and of themselves. Now here's the key. Minimalism drives flow because you reduce cognitive load and free up mental capacity, allowing your attention to funnel into the present moment such that you can plunge into flow in a given task. But also, flow drives minimalism. The more flow you get, the more autotelic you become, the more you do the work for its own sake. So the less stuff you end up wanting, the more work you do, and the less stuff becomes an obstacle to the work. In short, minimalism leads to maximalism in performance. So how do you actually do this? How do you use minimalism so you can get more access to flow state? How do you go from a possession maximalist to a performance maximalist? Do you have to sell everything you own and start living out of your car? Do you have to give up everything and never spend money? Well, here's the good news. For flow and peak performance, you don't have to go full minimalist. Instead, you can minimize where it counts the most and get the bulk of the benefit. There are three ways to do this. The first is to determine your minimalist sweet spot. The first step is to determine where you fall on the spectrum of minimalism based on your values and your goals. One end of the spectrum is being all in professionally driven to succeed professionally and fulfill your purpose to an extreme degree. The other side of the spectrum is being willing to make some trade-offs, knowing and being conscious of the consequences and sacrificing some professional success for personal pleasure that you can get through owning possessions. So which of these levels feels most like you? The first is tier one aggressive minimalism. For three years, my entire life fit into a single black backpack. Whether in Ireland, Barcelona, or Mexico City, my mornings were seamless. I'd wake up, slip on my shoes, and dive right into my passion project or adventure of the day, completely unencumbered. With aggressive minimalism, you prioritize a state of optimal performance, productivity, and the fulfillment of your professional purpose above all else. Your lifestyle is characterized by only owning 
what is essential for your work and your goals. You avoid any possessions that don't directly contribute to your craft or flow state. Nomadism, of course, is optional, but if needed, you could pack everything you own into a backpack and go wherever you want to drop the hat. The things you own are just tools. You don't own possessions and ends in and of themselves, you own them as means to ends. The ends being things you care about intrinsically, working, creating, traveling, etc. You're like an archer with a quiver containing only the arrows essential for hitting the target, no more, no less. With aggressive minimalism, you might have less than 100 possessions, a laptop, some supplements, charging cables, a smartphone, one multi-purpose jacket, five t-shirts, a few pairs of socks, underwear, a pair of jeans, one pair of multi-purpose soft pants, two multi-purpose shorts, one pair of flip-flops, one hat, one multi-purpose buttoned out, and maybe a Kindle or an e-reader. In fact, that was exactly what I had and nothing else. Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple, exemplified this level of minimalism. He was known for his meticulous focus on his work and the minimalist aesthetic of Apple's product. He famously wore a uniform of black turtlenecks and jeans, simplifying his daily choices to focus on his work. At one point, his home was almost entirely unfurnished, with only the essentials like a lamp and a sleeping bag. He once said, that's been one of my mantras, focus and simplicity. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end, because once you get there, you can move mountains. This helped Jobs channel his energy and creativity into Apple, driving the company to become the most valuable company in the world. In working with thousands of modern professionals and peak performers, we've compiled a list of the key possessions for flow. This list varies only by profession, but on average, across industries, it contains the only items that are necessary for aggressive minimalists who consider professional progress their top priority. You can download the list by clicking the link in the description. The next level of minimalism is tier two, tempered minimalism. If you live in one place, you'll inevitably own more stuff, assuming you're a householder. You've got furniture, plants, appliances, plates, glasses, and so on. This level strikes a balance between minimalism and practical living. You can think of it as being a household minimalist. Your possessions are carefully chosen for both comfort and for access to flow and the fulfillment of your goals and purpose, but you prioritize flow more than comfort. You might have a small, efficiently organized home with multifunctional furniture, a few well-loved items that enhance your daily life, like a quality coffee machine or a comfortable reading chair. You're like a Swiss army knife, compact, efficient, and versatile. Most of the tools are essential, but some of them are used less often, but are nice to have. The next level on the minimalist spectrum is tier three, mild minimalism. In this case, you're really a minimalist, but you're also not really a materialist or a maximalist, but you're conscious about your possessions and the cognitive cost of these possessions. Whether your reasons are family, kids, health, hobbies, aesthetic preferences, roots, or something else, you own more than the essentials, but each item is chosen with care. You enjoy your possessions and they add value to your life, but you're fully aware of their impact on your mental space. An example of this life could be a family home, thoughtfully furnished and decorated, each item chosen for its utility or the joy that it brings, despite the acknowledgement of the cognitive cost. Winston Churchill, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, is known for his leadership during World War II, and he landed on this kind of minimalism. Churchill had a deep appreciation for art, literature, and luxury, but he was also very conscious and deliberate about his possessions. His home, Chartwell, showcased his complex personality filled with books, paintings, and personal artifacts that reflected his interests in history, strategy, and culture. Churchill's possessions were chosen not just for utility, but for inspiration, despite the understanding of their impact on his focus. He even acknowledged all the great things are simple. So there is no ideal level of minimalism. It depends on you and your values and your goals. People vary in how much cognitive load increases as a consequence of possessions. But as you consider what level suits you, remember this, there's only so much cognitive load you can handle across your life and only so many units of attention you can allocate. Do you want that attention to be available for personal or professional use? Well, there is no right answer, but the question acknowledges the cost of ownership. Now, the second action we want to do here is to do a possession purge. After living as a minimalist digital nomad for years, I settled down in a lovely spot here in Los Angeles. Before I knew it, everything changed. I filled my sprawling house with gadgets, supplements, stylish clothes, spilling out of a walk-in closet. Now my mornings involved disentangling a knotted pile of chargers to find the one iPhone cord of the juice, rifling through a sea of predominantly right headphones to find the working left one, and digging through a wardrobe far too extensive for the climate. By the time I shuffled to my home office and assessed which of the four chairs best elicited productivity that morning, 
I had drained away precious cognitive resources, my mind foggy and fatigued by the countless micro decisions. My home base was now LA, so it made sense I would have more possessions instead of living out of my backpack, but things had gotten out of hand. I had to rebalance things and get into tier two minimalism, that sweet spot of the household minimalist. So I ran a possession purge. I removed absolutely everything from my bedroom, my office, and the other parts of the house, putting everything in one room in a massive pile. From there, I kept the 15% of the possessions that I actually needed and had someone get rid of everything else. And that's what you wanna do at this step. Now that you know your sweet spot on the minimalist spectrum, it's time to conduct a possession purge. First off, set aside one full day for the possession purge. It can take less time, but you probably want at least one day to do this. What you don't want is for this to sprawl out into weeks and weeks. You're making an event out of the possession purge and getting the job done in one fell swoop. Basically, you wanna structure it so that you wake up in the morning as one level of the minimal spectrum, say tier three, and you wanna to go to bed on a higher level, like tier one, aggressive minimalism, or tier two, tempered minimalism. To kick off the possession purge, gather up everything, and I mean everything you own. Put it all in whatever room has the most space on the floor in your house so you can see everything. And you're gonna go through each item and putting it in two piles, keep or cut. In the cut pile, you can decide whether to donate, gift, trash, recycle, or sell it later, but the key is you're removing it from your life. You'll take each item or category of item and depending on your minimalism sweet spot, ask a simple question and assign that item to one of the two piles accordingly, keep or cut. If you're aggressive and know you wanna go all in and focus everything on your purpose, your goals, your access to flow state, then the next part is simple. Just get rid of everything except whatever you need to advance your craft and your purpose and stay healthy and functional at a basic level. The filter for each possession is the question, is this a tool that advances my craft and professional pursuit directly? If the answer is yes, keep it. If it's no, cut it and be ruthless. Then sell everything or donate or give it away or trash or recycle the stuff in the cut pile. Put it out on the curb to be collected or put it all in the garage and invite folks to swing by to grab whatever it is that they want. This is the fast and fun way to do a possession purge and immediately reclaim a significant amount of cognition. For example, if you're a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu martial artist, maybe you keep your gi, your supplements, your foam rollers for recovery. If you're an entrepreneur, I'm assuming you're gonna keep your laptop, charging cables, and some clothing for meetings. If you're an artist, you've got your paints, your canvases, your brushes. Every other item should be aggressively filtered through you asking, is this a tool that advances my craft and professional pursuit directly? Now the filtering criteria for aggressive minimalists is simple. If you're less aggressive, the filtering question that you might wanna use is different. With each possession, you can ask, what am I assuming I'll get from this? And is it worth the cost of ownership? Meaning, relative to the cognitive load and performance trade-off that owning this possession and keeping it in my life results in, is it worth it? Is it worth the cost of ownership? You've now been given a sense of what the cognitive, creative, and performance cost of ownership is. So another way of conceiving of the question is, do I love this more than the potential cost of my attention and professional progress? The answer is always binary, yes or no. As you ask this question, a whole host of sub-questions will likely arise in the mind based on your own values and criteria. Maybe you have items that used to belong to a loved one who passed away, so the item has both positive and negative emotional associations. Maybe you have cables and adapters that you are likely to use at some point in the future and you value making use of what you own over the long haul more than you value purging it. These secondary considerations are useful and revealing. The more considerations that come to mind, the higher the cost of ownership, staking some claim to your attention and emotions. This isn't inherently a negative thing, it's just something to be aware of as you scrutinize each item and ask, is this worth the cost of ownership? When you subject every possession to the filtering question, is this a tool that advances my professional pursuit? Or is this worth the cost of ownership? The very act of doing the filtering gives you a sense of what the cognitive cost of ownership is. It takes time to do this. And often as we live our lives, we end up accumulating a lot of physical clutter that translates to mental clutter. This is a chance to purge the stress, hassle, and cognitive burden of your possessions and put yourself in a sweet spot for optimal performance. Now, the third piece here is maintaining minimalism. So at this point, you know where on the spectrum you wanna fall based on your goals and priorities and values. You've done your possession purge and gotten yourself to that point of the spectrum. Now, you need a simple mechanism to maintain it. This is how you make sure you don't end up imbalanced, like I did after a few years of living in LA. Thankfully, 
Maintenance is easier and takes less time than the possession purge itself. All that's required is to have a heuristic for onboarding new possessions. If you're a performance maximalist and a possessions minimalist, the heuristic here is simple. Get rid of something for everything you bring in. Avoid accumulation and you'll avoid ever losing the minimalism sweet spot. If you're less extreme with your minimalism, the key is to minimize the stuff creeping in. Create an algorithm for determining in advance whether something is worth the cost of ownership and become extremely conscious of the cost of ownership. Most people only understand the benefit of ownership and they don't get or viscerally feel the cost of ownership as they onboard new possessions. Remember that one of the main things humans crave is the neurochemical reward, the squirt of dopamine often called shopper's eye. Mechanistically, it's not the item itself that we want, it's the temporary neurochemical reward that it brings us. And of course, given the temporary nature of that neurochemical reward, we can pause and consider if these are alternative means for receiving such a reward without adding to our cognitive load brought on by possessions. So a filtering question could be, is acquiring this new possession worth the temporary neurochemical reward it brings? Psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi made a useful distinction between pleasure, which is often what we're chasing when we purchase anything beyond the essentials, and the enjoyment we get from meaningful engagement in work and flow. Pleasure doesn't lead to increased skills, growth, or a better future. Enjoyment through flow state does. It heightens, crafts, and shapes our future life and self that we are growing into. Now, suppose you find yourself slipping from using the heuristic of either removing a possession before adding or weighing the cost of ownership against the temporary squirt of neurochemicals. In that case, there's a backup. Run an annual purge. This is where you repeat the process of gathering all your possessions and subjecting them to the question, is this a tool that advances my professional pursuit or is this worth the cost of ownership? This keeps you conscious of the way possessions possess the mind and how your environment determines how you live and who you'll become. As Mihai Csikszentmihalyi put it, the organization of the household can be seen as a pattern of attention and intention made concrete in the artifacts and the ambience they create. A pattern that in turn channels the psychic energy of the inhabitants. The household objectively represents what the self is in terms of what things psychic energy has been invested in, or we consider significant to possess. If examined closely, it can reveal the patterns of attention that help to structure our everyday consciousness. Minimalism is a practice used by the highest performers across humanity's tenure to elevate peak performance and flow, and you can adopt it simply by getting rid of most of what you own, finding a sweet spot for balanced minimalism, and then reworking your relationship to possessions by coming conscious of the cost of ownership. The choice is now yours. You can cast off the cognitive load of possessions and clear your mind for flow, your most ambitious goals, and your fully realized purpose. It's a way of letting go so that you can lift off. And as you get rid of your external possessions, you'll want to clear the internal clutter. This starts with rebooting your rumination so you can effortlessly access your best ideas and creativity. Click this video to find out how.